Hey you guys, it's Peter and welcome to my channel Peterisms where I tell stories of my life and just little things that I have learned as I have grown into the person that I am today and my day has not gone as planned at all. It completely uh, went in a different direction. I had all these appointments today um, that I had to go to and each one of them got canceled one by one and so we went back to bed and now I'm like up and I'm like when things don't go the way that you think they're gonna go why not read some meditations? So I just did an Amazon haul over on my Peter Does Stuff channel. I actually wasn't sure if I was going to film any videos today or not. And so I thought, um, I'm going to bring the Melody Baby books out here and read some meditations. So let's get into it. Okay. It is April 5th. Let's see what the meditation is telling us for today. April 5th. Detaching in love. Oh, this is a good one. I remember, well, I don't remember the specific one, but I've talked about detaching in love before over here. So let's actually see what the one from the day before is. It's a really long one. Negotiating conflicts. Oh, that might be a good one to read. Let's read this one first, detaching in love, and then if we have enough time, maybe we'll go back and read that one. Okay, detaching in love, April 5th. Detachment is a key to recovery from codependency. It strengthens our healthy relationships, the ones that we want to grow and flourish. It benefits our difficult relationships, the ones that are teaching us to cope. It helps us. Detachment is not something we do once. It's a daily behavior in recovery. We learn it when we're beginning our recovery from codependency and adult children issues. And we continue to practice it along the way as we grow and change and as our relationships grow and change. We learn to let go of people we love, people we like, and those we don't particularly care for. We separate ourselves and our process from others and their process. We relinquish our tight hold and our need to control in our relationships. We take responsibility for ourselves. We allow others to do the same. We detach with the understanding that life is unfolding exactly as it needs to for others and ourselves. The way life unfolds is good even when it hurts, and ultimately we can benefit from even the most difficult situations. We do this with the understanding that a power greater than ourselves is in charge and all is well. Today I will apply the concept of detachment to the best of my ability in my relationships. If I can't let go completely, I'll try to hang on loose. Um, I was looking at the beginning of this book because I wanted to see if she has in here a definition for codependency because um, she's basically the one that coined the phrase. And so I wanted to um, see if it has, it doesn't in here have a good definition, but she does have the 12 steps. Um, of AA and Al-Anon in here and um, but she doesn't have a definition of codependency which is interesting because this is the sister book to codependent no more um, because where my mind was going to when I was thinking about detaching with love and I actually have a very specific story that I want to share with you guys I've actually shared it many times in my videos but I still kind of to myself kind of can't <laughs> kind of kind of I sometimes um, don't know what moved me in that moment. I think it was the work that I was doing around that time and things like that. You know, defining myself as somebody that is codependent, which means that I define my life through the life of somebody else, and um, growing up with a mother that was an active alcoholic and growing up with a lot of chaos. And it wasn't just the fact that, you know, my mother was an alcoholic. It was that my mother had a lot of mental health issues. My parents went through this very chaotic divorce. Um, I had, you know, a home here, a home there. I was going back and forth between homes. And then when I was with my mom, we would stay at my aunt and uncle's a lot, you know. And when I was with my dad, we would travel a lot. And so I didn't really have a lot of stability in my youth. And the stability that I did have was in the home that I was growing up with, in, which was my mom's which was very cozy and stuff like that. And there were nights that were little house on the prairie, but the unexpected was what I think I feared the most was that I never knew what I was walking into. You know, I could walk into 16 days in a row where it was little house on the prairie, chili dinners, game night, you know, she would read to me before we went to bed and it could be perfect, but it was always that apprehension of not knowing if I was going to walk into the one day where, you know, my mom had been drinking with her friends all afternoon and then they left and then I at seven or eight years or nine years or 10 years or 11 years or 12 years old was, or whatever age, was left to pick up the pieces. And I wasn't well equipped to do that, you know? 
Um, and that was kind of typical of what would happen. My mom would, her friends would come over and they would drink all day long and then she, they would leave and then she would continue to drink. And, um, you know, my mom was never a violent alcoholic. She was never a mean alcoholic. She just was a silent alcoholic and she was a very depressed alcoholic. And so she would get very sad and she would cry and she would listen to sad music and she would just kind of distance herself from me. And, um, and I never knew, like, if I was walking into that or if I was walking into Little House in the Prairie. I think that unknowing was what was so scary for me. And so at a codependency, when we define ourselves out of our other people needing us or taking care of other people or whatever, control is a huge factor in that. And as also myself being an alcoholic and an addict, control, which is something that we're not good at, is a huge part of that. And so it's often when we talk about surrendering, it's the surrendering and the letting go of control, right? The realizing that we really don't have much control over anything that happens in our lives anyway. What we have control over is our response to that, you know, um, how we respond to those things that have happened in our life. You know, I've said this in videos recently and I've said it throughout the years that um, growing up in an alcoholic home, when I say that, it makes it sound like every day that I was growing up, my mother was just, you know, throwing back the bottle and things like that. And that was not the situation. And there were, and I'm not just saying this to make excuses because I do not love when people throw things out there and pull them back in. Um, I like to live in the real. The, the real for me is that I was very scared for my mom when I was with my dad or when I was with my aunt and I wasn't with my mom because I would call and she would be intoxicated and then the next day she would apologize for it and be like, I'm so sorry that mom was, you know, had been drinking last night and whatever. Um, I don't even think she realized how like inebriated she was when I talked to her on the phone. And then at home, it wasn't that it was every day because it wasn't. There were fantastic days, you know? Um, my cousin Caroline, who grew up in kind of a similar home, she remembers her childhood as being very, very magical. Of course, she had two parents at home that were kind of taking care of her, you know? Whereas for me, it was just one in my mom's home unless I was with my dad. And so it was very scary for me. But the uneasiness of a lot of it was the uncertainty of what I was walking into or is mom going to start drinking after dinner or is tonight going to go smoothly or is dad going to call her and they're going to get into an argument and that's going to set her off and then she's going to start drinking. Like it was <clears throat> the constant uncertainty of it, right? That you never know what's going to happen next. At the same time, I'm being bullied in school and I, and I don't know where it's coming from next, right? And I can remember talking to my therapist years ago um, when Alex and I started going to marriage counseling and I was seeing the same counselor, we were both seeing the same counselor in individual counseling, he said to me, has anybody ever, has any therapist ever suggested to you that you possibly suffer PTSD as a result of being bullied when you were growing up? And the further we looked into it, it was that I have this kind of like this like scared dog response, you know, or like a cat arching its back when, you know, it gets scared or whatever because I never knew what was going to happen at school. I didn't know if that was going to be a day where everything was going to be easy or if that was going to be a day where I was going to be picked on relentlessly. I didn't know what was going to be said. How was, was it going to be about my clothes, how I walked, how I talked. I didn't know. I never knew what I was walking into. And then I never knew what I was walking into when I came home, right? And so um, I lived in a complete state of total uncertainty. And I never really felt safe ever, you know? And so for me, that was very, very scary. And so control came out of that as a response of needing to try to be able to control any area of my life that I possibly could. And uh, from that came codependency, you know, that if I could get rid of certain, I mean, I, from, I can remember from a very young age pouring down alcohol my mom's, but also, like, even at six years old, knowing that she could just turn around tomorrow and buy more of it, right? But I was, like, trying to send a message, I think, to my mom without saying it, because you're also afraid of always pissing that person off. That's, like, that's a big thing with codependency is that you depend on that person so much, and not just that you depend on them to take care of you like a parent, but you depend on their love. You need that person to love you, and you need them to validate you, right? And this is carried over into adult relationships. We carry those things over into our relationships, our romantic relationships, our friendships. Even I had those kind of relationships when I was working, you know, and I had that from my supervisor. I sought that kind of validation out from my supervisor and my coworkers, and I've had that with my friendships. That has been one of the biggest things I've had to work on, right? So when we talk about detaching from love, when you're in situations that are unhealthy for you, 
that you're constantly seeking that validation out and you'll literally let somebody walk all over you. You literally lay down and you're a doormat for somebody just because you need their validation. But at the same time, you're trying to control any aspect that you possibly can. It's time to get out, okay? And I also think, or it's time to detach. And I also think, uh, that many times we think the ult the ultimate, like when we say detach from love, that that means you have to get out. That means you have to leave. That means you have to divorce that person or leave that job or not be friends with that person anymore. Detaching with love just means that you're setting boundaries for yourself, you know? And a good example of that was in my life, sitting right in there where my mom used to live here, I've shared the story many, many times that my mom and I were talking one day and at this point I was, you know, getting my master's degree. I was in 15 hours of classes. I had like a 20 hour a week internship practicum. I was working 40 hours a week. I was in a relationship. I lived with my a boyfriend at the time and my roommate who was my best friend. I was very busy, you know, and this was also at the height where I was like working out and things like that and trying to be healthy. And, um, I was trying to see my mom like two to three times a week. So I was, and going to meetings, you know, and being sober and working in a sobriety program. It's where when people say to me, like, they don't have time for this or time for that, I'm like, listen, we can make all the excuses we want in the world, but you know, we always found time to drink and do other things. You can find time to take care of yourself as well, right? And, um, so I was still trying to see my mom like two to three times a week. So like after work in between like going there, going from work or going to a meeting, I would like stop by my mom's house for like an hour or whatever. I can remember I was just, I was exhausted. I was so exhausted from trying to like, I was trying to make my boyfriend happy and I was trying to do a good job at work and I was trying to do a good job on this practicum and I felt like, Everybody, I'm trying to make everybody in my life happy except for me. I can remember that day like really feeling that way. And I think my mom was just the first person that presented it to me. I think it could have been anybody that said it to me that day. Because my mom said to me, sitting in there, we were drinking a cup of coffee. It's like I'm sitting here drinking a cup of coffee with, with you guys right now. And she said to me, you know, I wish I got to see you more often. It was simple as that. And I just snapped. And I said, what? And she goes, I'm just like really lonely. Like I don't see people a lot and it would just be really nice to see you a lot more. And I thought she has really no idea like how hard I'm busting my ass to even see her at least two to three days a week. My boyfriend doesn't know how many sacrifices I'm making to try to like, you know, be a good boyfriend and also hang out with my roommate and also write a 25 page paper and also show up to my internship practicum, also show up to work 40 to 50 hours a week. Like I'm doing all this kind of stuff. Yes, ultimately to better myself, but I'm really working hard to make a lot of people happy in my life and I'm the one that's suffering. I'm the one that's not happy, right? And I looked at my mom and I said, I'm not responsible for your happiness. I always do that when I talk about it in a video or I share it with somebody. I like, I didn't even know where it came from. And she looked at me and she goes, what did you say? And this is where I'm so grateful for the mom that I had, right? Because I think there's a lot of parents that would respond to this in a completely different way. And I understand that. So sometimes you have to not say it. You just have to act on it. I said, I'm not responsible for your happiness. I don't even know where it came from, right? But in that moment, what I knew was... I was responsible for my happiness. If I was unhappy because I was spread too thin or I was working overtime to make everybody else happy and I wasn't, that was my responsibility, you know? My sobriety is my responsibility. My happiness is my responsibility. I, it's easy to finger point and put that off on somebody else, but ultimately it's my responsibility, right? I have choices in any situation. And my mom looked at me and she said, do I make you feel that way? Do I make you feel like I'm respon you're responsible for my happiness? And I was like, oh yeah. And she goes, I do? And I was like, yeah, you're sitting here, I'm coming over here two to three times a week and you're telling me that I'm not, like just saying that just like that reminded me so much of those conversations I would have with her. And I said, you're making me feel like it's not enough. And she said, I don't ever want you to feel that way. She says, I don't ever want you to feel that way, you know? And we had a good talk as a result of it. Um, now, I know that I've, I've shared that story with friends in my more personal life, and they're like, yeah, my mom would never say that to me. My mom would say, well, I, you are my child, and you do need to come over here four to five nights. That would make you feel very guilty. I think I was at the point whether my mom made me feel guilty or she didn't, I knew that I was not responsible for her happiness, and my life had to change as a result of that. That was also at a point where... I learned something very valuable about my friendships, and I've shared this later, like with my friend Tanya. Like my friend Tanya, when I ask her to do something, is not somebody that says yes all the time. She might say yes every third or fourth time. And at first it kind of hurt my feelings, and I can remember we had conversations about it because I stopped asking her to do stuff. This is years ago, 20 years ago, right? And then what I realized was that when she said yes, and she showed up, and we would go to Meyer, or we would go, you know, uh, out to eat or whatever, 
she was there because she wanted to be there. I want people in my life today that are there because they want to be there. I don't want people in my life that are there because they feel responsible that they have to be there or they feel pity or they feel like they're responsible for my happiness. I don't want anybody to be there. I want people to choose me, you know? I want people to choose me to be in their life and I want to choose people to be in my life. I don't want to be in somebody's life out of pity or them feeling like it's their job to make me happy. That's literally the definition of codependency and my job is not to fulfill somebody else's definition and my job is also not to continue to be codependent. My job is to take care of myself and validate my own existence and, and make sure that I'm making my own self happy. And that's the same thing for you as well, you know? Um, I think we've all been in those relationships where we bend over backwards to make somebody else happy, you know? I can remember in reading, um, I think it's in Codependent No More, when the, is it, it's not Codependent No More, which book is it? <laughs> a new vanity? <laughs> but anyway, I can remember reading this book and it was about this woman and she was talking about her husband, I think it was Codependent No More, and her husband, talk, she's talking about her has, husband having like a drinking problem. And so she's like, um, I'm gonna, she was telling me earlier that I need to like move these hostas and I need to start weeding this out. <laughs> So as soon as I get done with this video, she and I are going to have a talk about how we're going to move these hostas and stuff. She's real excited about that. But anyway, um, I remember reading, I think it is one of the stories in Codependent No More. I think it might be the first story, actually. And it's about this woman, and she's talking about trying to control her husband's drinking. And she talks about that she would buy, like, a six-pack of beer, and she would bring it home, and she'd say, okay, you can just drink this six-pack of beer. And he would be, and that sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? But as soon as the six-pack six pack of beer was gone, he was off to the liquor store buying more alcohol. And she'd be like, I don't understand it. Well, your husband's an alcoholic. One is too many, a thousand's never enough. You can never control that. But why that book was so helpful for me was it wasn't just about teaching people how to let go or detach with love to alcoholics. It was about everything in my life. You know, I was trying to six-pack a beer for anybody, any issue in my life, you know? Whether that was, now there's a helicopter flying over my head. What is going on today? It's like really low, isn't it? But, you know, as an analogy, I was trying to six pack a beer like my boyfriends at the time and, you know, trying to control every aspect of my life because if I could control it, then it felt safe to me. What I had to learn to do was let go of any kind of control and step into that and surrender all of that, you know, and just give up that and detach with love. To say, I love you enough that I don't need to control you. I don't need to try to control what you're going to say to me, how you're going to respond to me, what you're going to do, whatever. And I'm either going to love you and, and respect you and accept you for who you are and the choices that you're making, or I'm not. And I've got to see if that f fits into my life, you know? And vice versa with people in my life. And that's how it really should work. I don't want to have conditional relationships in my life today. I do not want conditional love. I don't want, and I've had a lot of it in my life, you know? Where it was like, I will love you if. I don't want that anymore, you know? But that also means that I've got to take care of, and I've got to clean up my side of the street and make sure that I'm being the best son, the best husband, the best friend, the best cousin, the best neighbor that I can possibly be, you know, <laughs> to somebody else. <clears throat> without, you know, having to hold them to a standard that I wouldn't hold myself to. Because it's important to hold myself to the same standard, you know? Detaching with love is hard. Sometimes detaching with love does mean leaving that relationship. But it doesn't always. Detaching with love can also mean I'm detaching my need to control anything in this situation. Just like I said to my mom that day, I'm not responsible for your happiness. That was me setting a boundary and saying... I am no longer going to work overtime to make sure that you're happy. You are responsible for your happiness. I, I can't do that. But I didn't stop having a relationship with my mom at all, you know? But that needed to be said. So anyway, let me know what you think about that in the comment section below. That was a good meditation. I need to be reminded of that. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.